Today, Eric Kronberg, our completions manager, will uh, present how our clients use drill bit geomechanics and machine learning to predict casing deformation in uh, any trouble stages. As we all know, uh, the risk associated with trouble stages play a significant impact on well economics and simply can be the difference between a profit, profitable well and uneconomic well. In Fracture ID, we have implemented a unique and innovative solution using drill bit geomechanics data, a data that you can collect in every single lateral to inform machine learning models to predict and allow you to mitigate those complex, very costly events like casing deformation. Before we get started, uh, just a couple of housekeeping points. We are planning about 45 minutes presentation. Uh, this will give us uh, roughly 15 minutes towards the end uh, for any technical discussions or any any questions that we did not cover through the presentation. Um, however, at any time during the presentation, please feel free to uh, go ahead and write down your question in the chat box. You can access the chat box towards the top right. Uh, click on that on on the on the chat window and type your question or simply unmute yourself and um, ask the question. Uh, please remember to mute yourself back um, in order to reduce the background noise. And lastly here, we uh, a recording of this webinar will become available for those who uh, couldn't join us today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to Fracture ID uh, webinar today. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Eric Romberg. Um, Eric, please go ahead and introduce yourself and the floors are yours. Thank you, Islam. I'm Eric Romberg. I'm the completion manager here at Fracture ID. And like Islam said, I'm going to be walking through a case study that we published at ATCE this last year about using machine learning models to predict casing deformation and casing collapse. Before we do that, um, I'm going to go through Fracture ID's um, technology, what we're doing, so that you can understand some of the inputs that are going into these models. Fracture ID, we take a small three-axis accelerometer, very much like what's in your cell phone, just beefed up a little bit to handle higher pressures and temperatures, and we put it right in the drill string. Uh, we've got vendors who can put it right into the drill bit. We can put it in the shank of a drill bit. We can put it in a blank sub above the motor. And what we're really interested in is the interaction between the drill bit and the rock. So what we do is we take the accelerations, we perform a fast Fourier transform to get those accelerations into the frequency domain. Once they're in the frequency domain, we can start to apply geophysical earthquake source models to come up with mechanical rock properties of the rock that the drill bit is crushing. So namely, we're looking at Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio as isotropic properties. We can do some fancy math to look at the anisotropic values, how those deviate in two different dimensions. If we're looking vertically down through the rock, anisotropy shows up as bedding. So we have a bedding indicator. And if we're looking horizontally, any anisotropy that's showing up perpendicular to that plane, that's fracturing. So we have an indication of fracturing. Now that we have some of those inputs, I'm gonna just talk you through high level how we're gonna go through this case study. We're gonna look at the scenario that kicked off the study. We're going to look at the proxies we're using for casing deformation and why we need why we need to use those proxies. We'll take a quick tangent to talk about machine learning models. We're not going to get too deep. We're not going to scare anybody off with too much technical details of these machine learning models. Then we'll look at the machine learning models that we built for this study. Then we'll look at how those perform against real world data. And we'll look at how we integrated these model results into the R operator's workflow 
and how else we can apply the same sort of process. And at that point, I'll wrap up and open the floor to questions. So the scenario that we're looking at, we have an operator in the South Midland Basin who's drilled 28 lateral wells. Six of those wells experienced casing deformation while they were completing, and the casing deformation was severe enough that it impacted the completion operation to the point where the real costs varied between about $100,000 and about a million dollars. The net present costs could be close to two to three million dollars um, looking at the current performance of these. So this is a very expensive problem. And to have it in six out of these 28 wells it was really impacting the economics of the entire operation. So, of course, the operator threw everything they could at it to try to figure out this problem. They saw a correlation early on with some seismic features that they investigated. As you can see here, in some of these later wells, they upped the weight of their casing to try to mitigate their casing deformation but they were still having casing deformation problems. So they came to us and we started to work with them to try to figure out what we could do to predict when casing deformation would happen so that they could mitigate it. We'd already collected the, our drill bit geomechanical data on 26 of these 28 wells. We'd been closely involved with their completions. So we had about 2000 frac stages that we had in our database ready to look at. And we took in some of their seismic data and we asked ourselves, okay, can we use our geomechanical data, that seismic data, and that well bore survey data to predict trouble stages that lead to casing deformation? Now, I said we had to use some proxies for, for casing deformation. And you say, well, we have six cases. Why do we need proxies? Well, these six cases, don't give us enough cases to build a robust model. You know, we can, it's really easy to find noise when you just have six instances and you're not sure what's causing it. So we took a look at all the completion stages and focused on those casing deformation frac stages and said, what's different about these stages compared to the normal stage? What can we use for a proxy to, to put into this model that we can predict? Two things popped out on this. The first is all the casing deformation stages had very high post job frac gradients, measured frac gradients above one PSI per foot. And so we say, okay, that's a, that looks like that's one good proxy. But there are cases of high fracture gradient where we're not seeing casing deformation. So we, we would like something else that we can match. So we have two imperfect models, hopefully, two models that do a good job at predicting what they're trying to predict. And then hopefully together that'll predict casing deformation. So the second proxy was low average sand concentration. And you know, there's no reason why casing deformation would cause low average sand concentration, but this is a response, an operational response to high treatment pressures. Person in the frac band sees pressures going up, they don't want to screen out and have a well bore full of sand. So they cut their sand concentration, pump more water, maybe pump some clean sweeps. They pump a lot more water to get the same amount of sand away. That average sand concentration goes down. We came up with a cutoff of 0.89 pounds per gallon for this case. And we did that by looking at a histogram of all the frac stages that we had in our database saying, what's a cutoff that will include all of the problem stages where operationally we really had to cut back on how much sand we concentration we were pumping we we drew that cutoff there so we say okay now we can predict hopefully we have a we can predict the sand concentration we have a population we know the low sand concentration is related to trouble it's really important to note that even with these proxies, this data is really imbalanced. For each of these proxies, we're only looking at maybe five to 10% of all the stages. And so that's gonna be important as we look at things later on. So now I promised we're talking about machine learning and I promise we're not gonna to get too scary here. We're not gonna 
require you to be a data scientist to understand what's going on. So very basically, what is machine learning? And machine learning is just using algorithms to find correlations in data. If we're doing a regression, you know, linear regression is a simple machine learning algorithm. Most machine learning algorithms are a little more complicated and can deal with more complicated inputs and nonlinear relationships. But anytime we're looking at um, at a regression, you can just think, oh yeah, we I've done linear regressions at some point in my career. This is that, but a little more beefed up. But machine learning doesn't just do regressions, it can also find what category something is in. And all the things that I have up here on the screen are instances where data scientists and other people have used machine learning to try to predict something, to try to identify something, put it into a category. You know, doctors will take pictures of growths and compare it against millions of other pictures where we know the outcome, whether that growth was cancerous or not, to try to determine whether that growth that you've got is a cancerous or not cancerous. You know, Google and a lot of other people have been put, putting a lot of money into self-driving cars. And here this picture of a roadway in England shows the sort of problems that they have to deal with. They have to be able to identify whether something is a road sign or is not a road sign. And if it is a road sign, what category of road sign is it? Is it a stop sign? Is it a yield sign? Is it an information sign? What should I do? What should I do because that sign's there? One of my favorite examples recently, there, there was a meme going around of, you know, hey, why is it that chihuahuas look like blueberry muffins? And people built machine learning models to try to separate these two because it's a fun example to, to prove things with. And the machine learning models that we're interested in today, does, will a stage have a high frac gradient or will it have a normal frac gradient? Will a stage have low sand concentration or a normal sand concentration? Now, once we have decided on a model, we have to figure out how to score it, what we should optimize for. And there's a lot of different metrics that we can use. With regression, we could use a root mean squared error or mean squared error. There's some other ones too. Each of these has, has their positives and their drawbacks. But now when it comes to classification, you know, we think, hey, how accurate are we at making these predictions? Well, if I had 2,000 pictures and only 10 of them were pictures of chihuahuas, I could say there are no pictures of chihuahuas in there and I'd be 95% accurate. And so accuracy might not be the thing you want if what you really want is pictures of chihuahuas. Now, up here on the screen, I've got these pictures and we say, let's pretend that these are the results of our machine learning model that was supposed to give us chihuahuas. And you say, well, you're only 50% accurate there. You're 50% precise. You're giving me half chihuahuas and half blueberry muffins. Well, am I looking for precision or am I looking for recall? Am I looking so that when I tell you that a picture is a chihuahua, I'm right 100% of the time? Or do we want to just say, these are all the pictures of chihuahuas and there might be some blueberry muffins in there, but there were 2000 blueberry muffins, but we got you all the chihuahuas. What are we looking for? What's, what's the goal? So we have to come up with a metric to score the model. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the model results. So now we get to get a look at the machine learning models that we built to predict frat gradient and low sand concentration. The first thing we did is we looked and said, hey, if we can actually come up with a prediction, if we can make a regression, for the frat gradient, if that regression holds for high frat gradients, will be great. That that will solve our problem for us. So we set out to build a frac gradient regression model. So we feed it all the all the information we have, and it gives us a prediction of this. Your frat gradient will be 0.87 or 1.02 pounds per foot psi per foot. The scoring metric that we chose was root mean squared error. But we recognize that no matter how good our regression model was, there'd be some error in it. And so we built
built a second model too that would give us just the probability that a frac stage would be above one psi per foot and that was the, all we were looking at the scoring metric that we used is AUC or the area under the curve and once we get into our results I'll take some more time to describe what that metric actually is this second model is actually a stacked model it's taking the output of our regression model as an input and so we were really careful about what other inputs we had so we weren't doubling up on our inputs and causing errors because of that a low sand concentration here is a picture showing what i was describing before here in bright red and bright green we have a typical stage one that we'd want to see we got a clean stair step in propent concentration pressures are below what we're looking for below our max never coming anywhere close to our max pressures so we're able to end the job with a normal sand concentration here in dark red and dark green we have a low sand concentration case where the pressures you can see are much higher than our typical case and so in response to that the operator drops the sand concentration and pumps a clean sweep comes up has to pump another sweep because they're seeing more pressure increase here pressure is coming up they pump a dirty sweep just to try to get the job away they never get up to the same sand concentration and they pump a lot more water to get the same amount of sand in so right from the get-go, this model was just trying to predict, will I have a low sand concentration or, norm, or normal sand concentration? For some parity, we said, okay, we also want that to be probabilistic and we're gonna use the same methods that we used with the frac gradient to come up with that probability. So now we get to look at our results. We built these models, said, let's train them up, see, see how close we can do, and see what comes of it. Here we have the results with our predicted frac gradient and a regression compared with the actual frac gradient. And you can see through the, through the meat of the range here, this is a pretty good regression. But as you get up towards the higher end, the regression isn't quite so good. Even here in the meat of the range, we're seeing some instances of pretty high frac gradients that the model is not predicting to be high. So we know that this is a pretty good model, but it's not perfect. So one of the really cool things about machine learning is that it gives you the importance of each of the data features that you put into it. So it's cool to look at this and say, okay, what does the model think is driving the frac gradient? first two variables together are the minimum horizontal stress gradient, the average over the whole stage, as well as the TVD. Together, that's just stress. You would expect that to have a pretty big influence on your frac gradient. This next one is really interesting. This is purely how far into the well you are as measured by your distance from the heel. Because we're dealing with a single operator and these wells are all very similar. Uh, this metric was just as good as the distance from the toe. Um, and looking at that, it says, hey, how far into the frack is also very important. The next two are seismic features saying the rock further out away from your well bore has some influence on your frack gradient. And then last, we have how much the minimum horizontal stress gradient varied along a stage. This was kind of surprising to us. Thinking about it, though, all of these stages were stress balanced. So we were already trying to minimize that difference. And it still showed up as an important feature, something that was driving about 8% of the model's response. Now, looking at this frac gradient classification, we're gonna talk about the different metrics that we're using a little bit. Here, we have what's called the confusion matrix. 
and we're looking what we think of as a y-axis here at our prediction. Up top, we've got predicting a high frac gradient, and at the bottom, we've got the prediction of a normal frac gradient. Along what we think of as our x-axis, we've got the actual results. Stages that actually had high frac gradients and stages that actually had normal frac gradients. So we've got our true positives and our true negatives on this diagonal, and we have our false negatives and false positives on this diagonal. So this model is looking a little more than 1,500 stages. Five of them, it predicts correctly that it has a high frat gradient. It never predicts a high frat gradient where there isn't one. There are no false positives. It does miss 29 true high frat gradient stages. But for the most part, it's doing pretty good. Looking at that regression and looking at this, we can say we don't have all the data features that are driving high fracture gradient going into this model. So we're never going to be able to predict all the high frac gradient stages. But when this model does flag a stage as being a high frac gradient stage, it's right. And so that brings us to this ROC plot or receiver operator characteristic plot. And what we're looking at is the false positive rate compared to the true positive rate. So a model that only performs as well as chance would follow this 45 degree line that's dashed right through here and would give us an area under that curve, the AUC, it would give us an AUC of about 50%. So with the area under the curve scores, we can think of that kind of like grades in school. If you're above 90, you're doing great. If you're above 80, it's okay. If you're above 75, you're probably doing okay. But if you're below 75 or even below 70%, you're probably not doing great. So now if we look at the sand concentration classification, you know, we're having a the model is having a little bit harder time differentiating true low sand concentration stages from sand concentration stages that it thinks will be low but aren't, and ones that it thinks aren't and but truly are low sand concentration. This is the Chihuahua problem that we're looking at. We've got a lot of stages that are normal, very few stages that have low sand concentration, and they're coming from all over the place. We're, we don't care what the mechanism of that high treating pressure is. We're just looking for the response to the high treating pressure. And you know, most completion folks will say there's not one universal reason for high treating pressure. There's a couple different ones, and we're not differentiating here. So this model with an AUC of about 0.84 is doing about as well as we could expect of it. Here, it's really interesting what's driving the model's vari variability. First, we have TVD, and there what we're really looking at is which target formation we're in. This model's saying you've got a much higher chance in one of these formations than the other because that's what the data told it. Next, we've got a wellbore construction issue. We've got that instantaneous 3D tortuosity. So how much you're bending that pipe is playing a role. Then we have Young's modulus from the drill bit geomechanics, the variability of minimum horizontal stress, again, from the drill bit geomechanics, layering the average across the stage from drill bit geomechanics, how far along in the frack you are along the wellbore, a distance from the heel, and then two more um, drill bit geomechanic measurements here. Looking at the probabilistic uh, view, we get very similar results. And the cool thing about this probabilistic model is, you know, we we're deciding a probabilistic cutoff saying if it's above 0.5, that's what we're going to call positive. If it's below 0.5, we'll call it negative. If we had enough data, we could actually move that cutoff 
and we'd be trading some false positives and false negatives and hopefully increasing the number of true positives. So now we've shown four models. None of them are perfect. All of them are pretty good at predicting the things that they're out to predict. But the question is, can we predict casing deformation? We can predict the proxies reliably. We know how reliably we can predict those proxies, but do those proxies actually predict casing deformation? Well, we had one stage with casing deformation that was not in the training data set. So the model has never seen this data. So this is just as good as drilling a new well and putting your model up against it and seeing the results. Here, both our high frac gradient model and our low sand concentration model predicted that this would be a trouble stage. In actuality, you know, both of those happened. We're predicting that casing deformation. You know, one one situ one scenario isn't enough to say with certainty that this is going to catch everything. But if we look at the other cases that were in the training data, our models are consistently catching casing deformation. But now, can we do this without that drill bit geomechanic data? We saw that it was an important part of those models. Well, here a couple of weeks ago, I went through the exercise saying, okay, can I build any model here with just the seismic and the survey data? Can I build any models that are predictive? And I couldn't. It just does not have enough resolution, does not have enough input to what's going on down hole to be able to be predictive. So we did all of this work and now we've got models that are predictive of casing failure. How do we help the operator integrate that into their workflow? Well, we worked closely with the integrator, with the operator to come up with this flow diagram of where to integrate this, their information. They're a very sci science forward operator. So they plan their well path well ahead of drilling it. And they have seismic data. They have the flag that they developed for those first couple of stages where they had casing deformation. So say, do you have that seismic flag in that well path? If you do, can you choose an alternate path? If you can, let's go ahead and plan that other well path. What can we do here? Plan that well again, say, does it have a seismic flag on it? If it doesn't, or if there's no alternative path, you just drill the well. Once that well is drilled, we're looking at the completion and we're looking stage by stage and we're asking, when we combine all that data and put it into our fracture ID model, are we seeing the flag that says that this will be a casing deformation stage? If we're not, go ahead and frack the stage. We're not worried about it. If we do see that, we're going to want to pump a leak off test. We worked really closely with this operator. They pump a consistent number of step down tests before the stage. Um, and so they have a lot of step down data. We, we worked with them and we found two of the six cases where there was casing deformation, they pumped step down tests in those. Looking at that data, when there was a high ISIP, that was indicative that that stage was going to have casing deformation. If it was a typical ISIP, it was fine. So we've got this secondary test that they can perform where we're filtering out so they don't have to pump this on every stage, but they can just pump it on the stages that are highest risk. If, that, if the leak off test shows normal ISIP, they go ahead and frack the stage. If they have a high ISIP, at that point, they abort the stage. And as a completions guy, it always hurts my heart to leave behind uncompleted reservoir. But looking at the economics of this, 
to where if you have real costs today between a hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars for casing deformation and potential net present costs of over two million to three million dollars it is totally worth it to abort that stage to lose that little bit of production so that you're not risking the production of the entire lateral all right so now we've talked about casing deformation and this process we can do this for any basin where the drivers might be different from basin to basin you might have a more tectonically active basin and so all of a sudden fractures might be more important you know there's all kinds of other variables that might be important that you have collected that we did not have available to us the important thing is is that process and this process is applicable to more things than just casing deformation this process we've run a similar process to help predict and mitigate fracture driven interactions to identify difficult to break down stages before you run into them. Theoretically, any issue with a geomechanical component, we can go through the same system and if we have the right data, we'll be predictive about it. That could include well productivity, could include induced seismicity, water breakthrough, any issue you have that has that geomechanical component this process should be able to come up with a predictive model for that the really cool thing about this scenario we were able to combine our drill bit geomechanical data and machine learning to predict what was unpredictable before you know no idea whether it would happen or not and We've been able to narrow it down and say risk profile on a per stage basis to help you make better decisions with that. And really key to that decision making process is the quality of that downhole data. We've tried to do it with just surface data. We've tried to do it with a lot of other data. And if we don't have quality geomechanical data of what your well board is going through, it's really hard to come up with a model to predict something that is as complicated as casing deformation. I'd like to thank you for coming to our webinar this morning, this afternoon, um, and open up the floor to questions. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Eric, thank you for a great presentation. You know, it's, you kept saying you warned us of taking us down the the data science rabbit hole. You did a great job, so you know, commend you for for your presentation. Um, I had a tr semi-trivial question. Um, did any of the operators actually do like if you? You know, if the workflow says skip the stage, did they actually do the stage to test if it would fail? That's question number one. Sort of to see, you know, are are we leaving? Are we being too conservative on on the on avoiding this the the stage? And then secondly, you brought up a very important point, which is, or several important points, which is there was no way to use macro data. Uh, you know, large scale data to predict these very local features that you could only obtain through the detailed measurements that you do in the subsurface. Um, did, does anybody have enough data to actually try to connect some surface measurements to these high level, you know, detailed subsurface measurements, you know, like when we were doing measure, you know, uh, 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 connected pipe and, and you know downhole measurements to go and connect that to surface measurements and build a proxy there so add another layer of proxy to your calculation so again thanks for your presentation and, and look forward to your to your answers
Thanks. Those, those are great questions. Um, as far as you know, being too aggressive about aborting the stage, you know, we we worked with them pretty closely and worked through a lot of different scenarios um, to where you know aborting the stage is kind of what shows up on that flow chart. Um, other options that that can be done um, are to have a a modified pump schedule to go in very tentatively and be ready to cut sand and be done much earlier. Um, you know, we've talked about um, their on-site frac consultants. They, you know, they've got engineers out there monitoring every stage. Um, you know, them working to keep the pressures down to where they're. It's not quite as black and white saying let's just totally abort this stage, but it's one of these where if I'm rolling the dice and I know I've got a 75% chance of losing the well bore or having casing deformation issues because I pumped that stage, you know, I'm going to think really, really hard about pumping that stage. And I'm, I'm probably going to come down on the side of aborting the stage. And that's why it's on theirs because that's where their management uh, felt the line was. But, you know, there, that's not the final option. There are other options beyond that. Um, for your second question, you know, we have not had operators gather enough surface data with enough resolution that could ever turn into that downhole data. We've looked at it, we've looked at it really hard. Um, in, in some relatively simple scenarios, you might be able to get one of the four downhole measurements from surface data, data but everything has to be just right to be able to back that out. Um, it's really hard to get Poisson's bedding or fractures from surface data. We have not seen that done reliably to date. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I was just trying to think that as a parallel, could we could you construct a proxy? But I, I know it's a hard thing. I was just curious to see if anybody was even attempting it. Um, yeah, not yet. Yeah. And so regarding the mitigating actions from a frac perspective, so what I see is let's say you that this would be an additional feed into your you know frac van. And you know, you're doing this. The thing is, this comes from when we drill. So you have some time to process. And as you're pumping, and I apologize if I'm getting it wrong, but uh, so you, you drill, you get your data, you do your analysis, then you have a, a call it a, an alert, uh, a, a risk map. And then you could start pumping your frac stages and see how things are behaving. Um, and then take corrective action. And I gathered from what you mentioned that most of them are, you know, stopping the frac or skipping the stage. Um, and uh, so th if that's correct, I, I just want to validate how I'm thinking, you know, if I heard you right, um, or I, I interpreted it right. The second, the question is, were these things happening closer to uh, toes or heels? Like, were you able to pinpoint, was there any, I know you didn't have much data, but was was there a bias towards being more closer to the heel or closer to the toe? There definitely is a bias closer to the heel, mm -hmm. you know, that, and that's very much so in line with what other people are finding um, yeah. in general, that, you know, you're, something goes on, whether it's you're weakening the pipe due to cyclical loading or whether it's something that you're doing to the reservoir by loading it up so hard, you know, I can't say, but there's definitely a heel word bias. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, uh, this is Islam. I had a couple of questions here in the chat. Uh, one is, uh, can these models be run prior to the frag? And I think, I think we, we, we've talked about that. And um, the other question is, which feature in, in the model are provided by Fracture ID? Okay. Absolutely, these can be run before the frac. That's, that's the idea behind it. Um, 
I'll come back here and I will step through which features in the model come from Fracture ID. So what we're looking at here is the sand concentration model. Um, Young's modulus comes directly from Fracture ID's data. Here, this feature, we're averaging it over the length of the whole stage. The minimum horizontal stress gradient is coming from the Poisson's ratio that we get from the drill bit geomechanical data. Here, we're looking at the standard deviation of the minimum horizontal stress along the length of the stage. Layering, you know, that we're looking at a measure of anisotropy. That's your VTI anisotropy. Um, here's your average over the course of a stage. Um, Young's modulus, again, the how much things are varying over the course of a stage, and that average Poisson's ratio. So for the sand concentration model, here we are. We've got one, two, three, four, five of those features are coming from our process. Something I didn't mention. We had a lot more data features that we tested out on here. We had a process to determine which features actually gave us the best model. So you're looking at a very highly selected group of features for each of these models to help these models perform the best they could. Um, on the frac gradient model, we're looking at that SH min, the average over the stage coming from drill bit geomechanics as well down here as the standard deviation of the SH min for that FRAC regression. So those are the features that are coming from Fracture ID. The other features are coming either from the wellbore surveys or from, in, in this model, we had two seismic features. We have most negative curvature and similarity. Those are seismic features. So that's where all this data is coming from. And, you know, it's the, the reason why I'm able to come out here and say we to predict these things that have geomechanical components, we need good high resolution downhole data is because these models are showing up time and time again how important that data is to the model. You know, we cannot predict the variability that we're predicting without that data. Um, you know, getting a little bit fancy here. Um, so if you characterize this using the non-fracture ID data, you would have, you know, you could run your workflow, right? And it would be less predictive and it would have greater error and greater uh, lower a, AUC and the whole bit. Do they, do they identify the stages? You know, is the, how, what, what is the increase in the, in the risks that would, you know, a, an operator would take? Because I, I, thinking at it from a value add perspective, you know, I completely agree on the value of what you all are doing and why it's important. But you're, you're presenting me to me the complete case, not the case of the operator that didn't hire Fracture ID. To, to get the data. So I was just curious to see, you know, if you could at least talk a little bit about that, you know, how much better is it, or is it just impossible? So, like I said here, a couple of weeks ago, I went through the exercise and said, yeah. you know, can I build a model that will work without that drill bit geomechanical data? You know, saying, you know, the operator doesn't want to put out the little bit of money that it takes to get a little bit more data. And, you know, again, looking at chihuahuas and blueberry muffins here, you know, we've got a stack of 2,000 pictures, and 95% of them are blueberry muffins, and we want to build a model that will at least scoop up most of the chihuahuas, is what we're trying to do. And I could get some models that were highly accurate. I could get some models that had decent scores, but I couldn't get models that could reliably predict any of the stages where there was casing collapse. Remember, casing collapse is not something we're actually 
regressing towards we're not or classifying we're we've got these proxies so every time i looked at my six cases of casing deformation none of the models without the drill bit geomechanical data predicted a single one of those um and so looking at that it you know it takes a big hit with with uh the metrics that we're looking at even though I can get some decent metrics, I can't build a predictive model. And so looking at other metrics shows where the weakness of those models are. And so I worked with that and I really just could not get this to, I could not build a model that was predictive without the downhole geomechanical data. Uh, one question, Eric, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, what about the other variable that can impact the casing integrity, for example, the isolation, the cementation, or the grade of the pipe? Oh, that is an excellent, excellent question. Um, you know, I, looking at this, you know, um, come back here to my regression, you know, we're seeing that, hey, we're not capturing everything. and I suspect that if we had better information about isolation, um, about cement placement, I'm guessing that we would start to pull some of these uh, from being not predicted and high to where we're actually predicting that they're high. Um, I definitely think that isolation plays a role. Um, in casing deformation and i i also think cement placement placement also plays a role to where if we had that information i would love to be able to incorporate that into models and and see what came out thank you Yeah, we, we, we have time for uh, another couple of questions. Uh, if anyone on, on the line here have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and, and go ahead and ask. Yeah, just, you know, thank you for again for the opportunity to keep, you know, picking uh, uh, Eric's brain. First, I'll say hi to Steve, you know, who's I see he's logged in, so I'll say hi to Steve. But um, so it's interesting keeping on this particular slide. Um, you know, the fact that your strongest signal is the SH min, but then you go to T TVD, distance to heal, uh, tortuosity, which again, you know, you can have a measure of tortuosity from from the survey. Uh, most negative curvature. Now, some of these models, I'm surprised that you know dropping those features, you know, the the valuable features, because you know the order changes once you add these features. You still couldn't build a model, so I'm, I'm you know, surprised about that. I, I would just find it surprising, but it could be the case. I'm, I'm not denying it, but um, I think this is a great opportunity to show what is the value, and I, I, I do, you know, share your the value proposition that you mentioned, which is, you know, this is a high cost proposition for many operators. Luckily, they had all that data, right? So they could then create a plan forward. So, you know, it's convincing somebody beforehand to get the data to fix future problems is a complicated thing, but now that you have the data, but I, I, I am surprised that you couldn't build a model, but it's, there must be something there that I, I'm not seeing. Well, you know, the, the way to think about this, you know, this most important feature here, you know, is about 25% or, you know, some, somewhere just shy of 25% of all the variability. So, you know, predicted here, we've got, you know, between, about 0.75 and about 0.105 or so um, is is our domain. So 25% of that variability of where a prediction is going to be made is coming just straight from this one feature. You know, you put in the 8% here, and that's 30% of the explanatory power of this model is coming from how that minimum horizontal stress is changing along the well, what the average is and, 
and how much variance there is. You know, you're, those two features are describing more than 30% of that variability. And so, you know, you take that 30% out and, you know, you, you knock your effectiveness of the model down by 30%. You know, this is, you know, the models that we built, like I said, they're good, but they're not, not perfect. You know, we're not predicting with 100% accuracy. We're not, we're not hitting everything dead on every time. So if you reduce its effectiveness by 30% and you've only got 70% efficiency, your explanatory power goes away dramatically. And <laughs> No, I, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not yeah. I just find it, I, I support your concept, I'm just surprised that, you know, it goes from, you know, a useful model to a useless model. I would have thought it would have been a crappy model, but, you know, yeah. again, I, I have to, you know, look at the data and how it works. So I, I appreciate the, the insights. And, you know, the, the other thing to mention, you, you mentioned that it's hard to get people to pay for the data up front when this is the, the reason. Um, this operator was actually, like I said, they were stress balancing their completions. And so they were using us for that. So that we, you know, Fracture ID has other products and other applications. Um, and so that more than pay for the acquisition of the data. And this is just a really cool value add for when you have the data. Like I say, Fracture ID had collected data on 26 of their 28 laterals. And that's why we were in a position to help them. And they were able to, to take this model into their workflow. So, you know, it's, it's one of these where it's, it's an additional value add to data. I definitely know that if I, you know, I've, I've sat in operator chairs before and I would be hard pressed to pay for this just to mitigate casing deformation if I wasn't having a casing deformation problem. But if I was having casing deformation problems, you can bet I'd be throwing money at whatever out there had a chance of being able to mitigate those problems. That makes sense. So, um, so you, um, you mentioned um, if you could share the, you know, the two papers that you mentioned. Um, I know that you, you. you sent the message to me, if, if you could just send it to to um, to those who, of us who attended, or at least a link to it, so we can just pull it up. Absolutely, Mariano. Thank you so very much for your questions, and uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks, Juan, as well. I have another one, if you have a quick look. Absolutely. Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, do you have any experience in, uh, with any fall or any geological feature with higher uh, fracture gradient? Because we are currently working in a case where we see some area with, with faults with higher um, ISIP. Um, yes, we have seen that. We haven't, we haven't had enough data to put together uh, machine learning models to predict those, um, but we have definitely highlighted faults for clients and in our data and based on what they'd seen in offsets, they they correctly predicted a change in frac gradient from one side of the fault to the other. That's great. Yeah, thank you, sorry. Thanks, Hot One. All right. If there is no other questions, I would like to thank you all for attending today and all the good questions. Uh, Eric, thank you very much. I definitely learned something new today and um, let's stay in touch. Please, if you have any question, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our emails and contact over there he here on the on the display. Um, if not, um, um, info at fractureid.com and uh, we'll get back with you. Thank you so very much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.